Welcome everyone to tonight's Artificial Professional Development Webinar Series. Tonight we're going to look at Module 7, Managing Space and the Offside Line. So um, as we go through this, um, just a quick reminder of how to use your GoToWebinar control panel. If you have a question, please type it in the questions box. And then if you have, um, uh, what's the word I was looking for? issues with uh, you know audio or something like that let me know and I'll try and do my best as we go um, and then you know go from there so get kicked off right away so by the end of tonight what we'll hope to have done is uh, established a working definition of, of quote-unquote space in the context of a rugby match obviously uh, we're gonna see uh, some video examples and look at understanding the use of space and how it affects the game uh, and then see and understand how the referee can then manage that space in the offside line in a game right so we're, we're going to take a look at okay well if this is relevant for this reason then as a referee this is what I need to do to um, help you know facilitate the game within that context and then lastly we will just have a really quick reminder of the world rugby high tackle framework and uh, what it means for us only because it's so new okay so as we do every time we're going to take a look at how this particular topics uh, topic relates back to the rugby canada referee profile so we're looking at a couple of things here with relation to um a little bit more of a philosophical approach so the first two modules that we did really focused on game prep and then getting in the mindset of age grade rugby with the uh, upcoming high school season at the time and then looking at uh, some technical aspects for the next four sessions after that right so we looked at uh, pieces around uh, the, the the ruck tackle the scrum the line out and um, I think that was it Anyways, and <laughs> it's funny, they all meld together at one point, but anyhow, so uh, there were some very technical pieces. Now, although what we're going to be talking about tonight really does, obviously is rooted in the law, uh, the approach we're going to take is to then now look at it from a more philosophical perspective and see how it can uh, help us manage the game in general and help us with some of our decisions as we go through a match. So from this perspective, the, the the idea of space here has an impact on all phases of the game, whether that's set piece, open play, uh, whatever it is that's happening in front of us, this concept of, of rewarding space can certainly be um, something that we take into all of these different uh, phases of the game. So uh, from a specific point of view, when it comes to the actual profile here, uh, from a technical perspective or technical pillar, we're looking at our defense clearly being on side at the ruck and then you could also take a look at okay are, are tacklers and tackle assists clearly releasing and moving away and we'll, we'll get into why uh, as well as sorry uh, uh, players arriving in the gate uh, through the gate and on their feet and i'll explain why it is that i've added those two in there as we go through uh, the rest of the presentation so from a tactical perspective we're certainly looking to reward space uh, space that's been earned and we're going to be using some contextual judgment as we go through some of these video clips as well <clears throat> and then finally from a game management perspective clear communication so clearly letting players know what it is that a we're looking for but b um, making sure that we have some understanding right because there's no sense in making decisions and then discussing decisions if we're not being on the same page so uh, that's certainly an aspect and then I did include zero tolerance for foul play not that um, this particular session has anything to do with foul play per se however when we get to some of the concepts of space in other areas of the game we'll see how foul play can uh, be a part of that discussion so really what is space for me <clears throat> how we go about making decisions um, from phase to phase and game to game really depends on our definitions of certain things, whether it's uh, the ruck for, from a very technical perspective, uh, the tackle 
uh, you know, one knee on the ground, okay, everyone knows we have to clearly look at releasing the ball carrier and all that kind of stuff. Um, definitions of a line out, when is it over, all that kind of stuff. So using this principle of coming up with a definition for space, are we able to apply that to how we then officiate the game? And I think in this particular area, when we get to this more philosophical view of the game, uh, we, we all certainly have different ways of looking at the game. So there's some ideas here about what types of game people might look to believe in or might believe in, in terms of this is what I see as the, the ethos of the game in some way outside of, of our core values and the camaraderie and this, uh, on, um, and the respect component that comes with rugby, um, you know, some people will look at the game as, okay, well, I'm going to look at everywhere on the field and figure out, can I score from here? I'm going to look at uh, playing to my strengths as a team, whether that means I'm going to keep the ball in hand because that's our strength, or I'm going to uh, play the territory game because that's where I need to be. Um, and then obviously others will look at it as a game of inches instead of you know, that bigger picture perspective and look at winning the gain line and how are we winning that gain line, whether it's at set piece, whether it's phase to phase, uh, whether it's in the air, all that kind of stuff. So with the referee profile, it is a bit of a reflection of my personal view because we talk about rewarding teams with space earned. So what does that actually mean? So for me, a rug rugby is a game of exploiting space. Right, so I'm looking at um, how is it that players in an overall context of the game, how do they go about trying to score, right? How do they go about trying to put the ball in the other end of the field? How are they looking to make the gain line? All that kind of stuff. So for me, it's about exploiting space. That space can be almost everywhere, right? So I'm thinking about this as, as kind of a uh, overarching principle for how players are going to try and get over the whitewash. So we're looking at space between defenders, space over the ball, whether that's at ruck time, whether that's at scrum time, etc. Space in the air, whether it's contests in the air from open play kicks, line out contests, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, obviously at set piece, right, winning those those little spaces in order to then be able to move the ball forward. So that's the overall principle I bring to, okay, how now do we manage this space? So before we, uh, sorry, and sorry, impact. so the impact then for myself as a referee is um, who has earned the right now to play in that space by legally dominating their opponent. So we're not talking about, I need to see them come from five meters away and smash somebody um, five meters deep, you know, at rough time or what have you. What I'm looking at is who is going forward in certain areas of the game and are they doing that legally? If they are, we're going to reward them with the space that they've earned, which goes back to the referee profile. Okay, so we'll take a look at some examples and then I'll, I'll be able to better explain it, how that works. So I just wanted to look at some key areas of the game where I, again, this is my opinion, but when I look at how space affects the game these are areas that we can we can all take a look at and see okay this is what this means for the players on the field at this moment so a real obvious one is obviously the defensive offside so as we do with all of these i'll play it through and then we'll come back and we'll take another quick look and discuss Okay, so when we look at the defensive offside line, how does this impact the game? Well, if we're not onside, we can obviously see how it affects the ability for Red here after this tackle to be able to have time and space to make decisions. So that's a trigger word for me. Do the players have time and space that they've earned to make a decision? In this particular video example, we're looking at a team that um, was able to collect the ball off the line out, or throw the line out, make a significant amount of territory um, from that line out through the defensive line. 
So there should be a lot of opportunity here for red to be able to play the ball, provided there's no contest at the ruck, which there isn't. So once the ball is moved, I expect to see plenty of time for red to be able to make a decision here. The problem is we have quite a few players for blue who are clearly in front of the hind foot of the ruck. So these are areas of the game that when we're, when we're allowing that pressure to happen, it's not to say that it's necessarily the referee's fault if there's a knock on, for instance, here. But what this does do is close down the time and space for the team to be able to play within the space they've earned. So they've earned a few more inches here um, that we need to be able to reward as a referee. Okay, so how we go about managing that depends on game to game, situation to situation, players to players, where we are. We're two minutes and 44 seconds in the game. Is this something we can just be aware of and work at the next breakdown to manage this? Do we dig this right away? All that kind of stuff. That comes down to your philosophy as a referee and what will work best for you in that game. In this instance, I'd like to see a penalty here because I think Red has deserved uh, the ability to play within the space and they haven't been afforded that. Okay, so this is just one aspect of the game where defensive players not being on side affects how uh, or what options that team in red has. Okay, so contest in the air. What does space look like when we have contest in the air? So let's just watch the example and again, we'll walk through it. Okay, so the, first of all, I've, I apologize. There will be a lack of domestic games in this presentation, um, as well as a lack of um, women's games in this pr presentation, mostly because when we look outside of tackle ruck off sidelines, uh, the rest of it, uh, this notion of space, um, just the camera angles uh, and the quality of the video was a big part of why I chose um, to use some instances from uh, the Super Rugby game, the Super Rugby final this past weekend. So um, when we look at contest in the air, what I want us to consider is as we walk through this clip and we see how space, quote unquote, is affected, these are the things that we want to be aware of. And it's not that this is a negative impact whatsoever, but what we do want to make sure is that when we go to con look for, okay, what's going to happen here that I as a referee need to be aware of? Most kicks in open play tend to be um, for either territory, to put it into touch, or to contest it in the air. It's not doing one of those three things, it's probably not doing a very good job. So um, in this instance, we clearly see where the chase is on and we're gonna be contesting in the air. Uh, I think in this instance, the, ball, the kicker is actually the one who ends up looking to retrieve it. So where's our next action? Our next action is gonna be in this space where that ball is probably gonna come in and around and land. So as a referee, what I need to be aware of is first things first, is Orange in any way in a position to impede the contest by taking away space? At the moment, no. So the kicker will put these people on side, this guy's retreating and out of the way, and now what we can do is focus on, great, where's that next point of space that needs to be contested or will be contested and it'll be in the air. So as we go through this, and we did a little bit of this work when we looked at um, contests in the air when it came to foul play, what do we need to see for there to be an appropriate contest? Well, who won that space? This is a great example of two players having both earned the right here to be able to be in that space and contest for the ball. Whatever happens here, we're going to be able to play on from it or advantage knock on or whatever ends up happening. I think uh, Orange ends up collecting the ball. So it's a really great example of, hey, these are all of the areas of space now that I need to be aware of. How are we allowing for that contest to happen? And did anything prevent that contest from happening and all that kind of stuff. So again, these are the steps that I would take in this particular instance. We're looking at did all of our players start on side? Tough to see on this angle, but I'm pretty sure they did. 
right? Did we clear the space in and around where that ball's going to land? And then did we own the space in the air with appropriate timing and the ability to actually legally contest for the ball? It's a great example of um, a good clean contest in the air where both players earn that right. Great, now it's jump ball, right? Whoever ends up with it, off we go. So an example at the lineout, we'll take a look. Oh, my apologies. Let me just change that setting. Sorry, I missed that. So it's funny, we can probably, probably just relate this example to saying, well, they're offside, they're not 10 meters. Yes. But again, this is, and this is how we can look to build consistency within our decision making as we bring our, our knowledge of the law and the te technical aspects and kind of merge it with our philosophical outlook of the game. So our philosophy here is what areas of space do we need to contest here now? We need to contest the space in and around the line out as the mall forms. Okay, great. Uh, oh, by the way, we have a bunch of players joining this mall illegally. So what does that do to our contest in space? They're not legally going forward and legally having earned the right to play within that space. So we need to make a decision here. No area here to be able to manage this. I think we just need to uh, bang this one in and um, bring those players back to that offside line where they were supposed to have been. Okay. Easy enough. It's from time. So this is, to me, a really interesting one. Let's just watch this. And as you go through the video, just think about what is it about that fight for space that players are trying to do here? And how does this affect the scrum? Okay, so what I'm trying to get at with this particular clip is that we're not talking about massive amounts of space. We're not talking about a massive roller skate type of dominance of the scrum. What we're talking about is have what has one team or one player or the players involved in this particular area of contest won the right to that space legally. If they have, we need to make sure that they get rewarded, whether that's with, you know, turnover ball, whether that's with um, an advantage, whatever the outcome is, the philosophy around why we're making this decision has to do with where this battle of space is. So as we look through the scrum, and again, I, I, I could have picked some domestic competition, but we just don't get quite as close. So, oh, my apologies. So as we go through it, what we'll see is um, and, and we can go back or you can go back through the uh, Scrum webinar to take a look at what roles of the players are. Um, but what we do want to make sure we see is when we look at a loose head prop and a tight head prop on this side, the other side, which team's putting it in, there's all the variables that we'll need to take into account when we make our contextual judgment piece around this decision. But the the emphasis or sorry the starting point needs to be on once we've got our setup right once we're happy with all of the technical aspects of getting ourselves set up for success is great what is this player ultimately trying to do let's say and ultimately the loose head just wants to win that space where under the tight head's chest that's all they're really trying to do at the end of the day that's the philosophical kind of outlook on it is where's that battle for space happening? As soon as that battle for space happens, we need to see is it legal? Is it legal here by red? Absolutely it is, right? Is it illegal by orange? Yes. Can we make a decision here? I believe so. So I think we end up with the right decision here because we see it's not a huge dominance of space, but it's enough for us to see, yeah, we've earned the right to be able to play the ball here and we're not able to because the scrum collapses.
right? So that's the idea around how space affects the game, that contest for space and the ability to win that contest and win that space to allow us to play within it. Okay, <clears throat> I also take this approach similarly to um, contest for the ball. All right, so red does a really good job. Oftentimes we talk about attacking opportunities. Um, for me, red does a really good job of um, being able to work within the space they've earned here, okay? So our next point of contact or our next point of, of contest is gonna be now, as soon as that tackle happens, over the ball. So it's just another aspect of who's earned the right to play in that little space now. It's a tiny, tiny area. And how quick it does it need to happen? Obviously, extremely quickly. So when we see our number seven for blue here come over the ball, it's a really good job of releasing, going back for it. The ball's really tucked away, goes to fight for it. Seems to be staying on their feet. And has earned the right to be able to play the ball in that space doesn't come away with the ball so our decision has to be to reward them with it right so as we go through the um, the rest of this when you take a look at the rest of your games right when you go back and look at your games this could be something where you're not necessarily using this exact definition um, but when you do look at your definition your personal philosophy on how is it that I decide when to reward players and when not to reward players this to me is a huge component of, of how we end up coming with consistent decisions. So if our interpretation or, or our philosophy is always the same, our understanding of what each individual scenario looks like and whether or not we think therefore it merits a decision to reward a team or to play on or call advantage or whatever, that should be consistent throughout the game. And it should lead us to a little bit more success. So something to keep in mind as we go through um, a couple more examples here. Uh, there is a question I will get to in a moment. I'm just going to finish this piece and then we can go on to managing pieces. Um, and then the last one here, the last example is, okay, when we take away space uh, through this, this um, scatter rucking technique. So kind of tough to see, but let's watch through it. Right. So the reason why I, I clip that all the way through to the try is to see, okay, is this something that t completely affects the fact that red scores a try here? Maybe not, right? So I'm, I'm really reluctant oftentimes to sit here and say, well, because of this, therefore this. In many instances, yes, that's true. Um, however, in a rugby game, there's so many other little decisions that, that uh, affect the outcome of that particular moment that we can't always say that this uh, one incident necessarily led to an outcome. However, in this particular case, if we watch the red support player on the far left at this next breakdown, we'll see where they end up coming from. So quite a ways away, number 10 I believe it is, and they take a blue player who's at the side of the tackle area here kind of far away I'll give the referee the, a massive benefit of the doubt here because the ball ends up bouncing out of the ruck and into the hands of the next player. The issue we have is where does that player go? Right into that space that was just vacated. So is scatter rucking always a penalty or always an issue? Not necessarily, but in, in an instance where it creates that space that we're able to exploit, but not legally, can we reward that action, right? Can we allow that to be um, a play on situation? It's a really tough one because it's it's, it happens so quickly and the dynamics of the ball popping out of the ruck 
make it so that it's not a natural kind of nine over the ball, get it out to the next first receiver, that kind of thing. Um, and it wasn't really an offload. So if our philosophy is, well, has Red earned the right to be able to play in that space that was just cleared out by number 10 here? If your answer is no, based on your philosophy, then we have to come back and penalize Red there for taking a player beyond the ruck, taking out a player beyond the ruck. So um, those are the types of, of areas where if we have our philosophy kind of set in our mind, it makes that decision really easy for us to be able to justify and we would make that decision every single time because we've gone into that thinking, has Red earned the right to play in this space? No. Okay, we'll bring it back. Okay. So I see there's a question here and this is fairly short. Uh, oh, Chad is asking if the recording of the Scrum webinar will be uploaded to YouTube. Yes, I apologize that it has not been yet. I will make sure tomorrow that all of our, or Wednesday after we do the French one tomorrow night, uh, that all of our webinars are up to date. I apologize they haven't been up to date on the YouTube page. Okay. Okay, so we've got our philosophy. We've got these ideas of um, what it is we want to try and see in these areas of contest for space. So how do we manage it? So a couple of key points here. When we look at the ruck, we want to clear, start with our posts, and then we want to manage those who are clearly in front. Keep in mind the examples we're showing today are where the referees have assistant referees. So it's a lot easier to um, not give up control in any way, but certainly uh, work with the assistant referees on, on the joint responsibility of working on that offside line with players, um, especially as we get to you know, higher levels of rugby where space is contested as opposed to um, just kind of passively being in the way or being offside. Right, so this is an example of where the referee and the assistant referee can take a look at, okay, where do we start and how do we manage the rest of it? So from a referee's perspective at this next breakdown, right, we need to start with our posts. So there's a bit of a point but clearly we haven't been able to get our posts to, to move back. So on the short side where the ball came from of the, of the ruck, we can see, and the only reason why I picked this example is because it's right on the halfway line. So it's a great angle with the camera. Uh, but uh, on, the, on the short side where the ball came from uh, on the field, we see that the players are kind of angled to their goal line. Whereas on the near side or flow side of the, of the play, we can see that the players a couple of them are angled in towards the up, uh, opposing goal line and into that and crowding that space. So this is a great example here of where we're able to get the referees through that management piece. It's able to get our post pillars to clearly be on side, which is great. And that makes our offside player so much easier to see because most players or most teams will line up their defense off their ABCs, post pillars, first defender, whatever you want to call them. Right, so if we can manage this area of the game really well, these players in and around the ruck as a referee, it makes it that much easier to see these players offside. So does the pressure necessarily mean that's why we kick or was the kick always on? That's for you to decide when you get out onto the field, right? So we're not here to necessarily judge the referee. What we're doing is taking a look at, okay, how do we look to manage these particular situations? Easiest way to do that at ruck time is to focus on that post pillar. Once we get the post pillars to really, or, or first defenders to make sure that they're on side, we can then get our scan out, make sure that everyone else is lined up on that uh, first defender should have some good clear lines of sight. So most um, contested balls in the air will come from either kicks in open play, um, uh, up and unders, or box kicks. So we'll take a look at the box kick first. So the biggest indicators obviously are 
uh, chasers starting clearly on side. So just keep in mind as we go through it. Now, uh, well, let's play it first. Okay, so um, what I like about this particular example is the awareness of the assistant referee that uh, we need to make sure because this player is really tight to the uh, to the gain line or the offside line where the ball ends up being kicked from. Okay, so he's got a this player can't be up here. Obviously, we need that player to be back behind where the kicker is. What we need to make sure we do is is um, not adjudicate these based on what we whether or not we thought their timing was wrong. What we need to do is make sure that they're clearly in front if we are going to make a decision to come back here. Looks like we're happy to be able to play on from this. So as a referee, what's our best course of action here? It really depends on what you're refereeing and where you are in the field and how much help you have. So without assistant referees, you will probably want to be in a position to be able to see that chaser. That's the key to um, our referee positioning. So when we look back to our positioning video uh, or module, we discussed um, going from uh, in transition across the middle of the field from chariot to chariot to chariot. Most box kicks, most, I won't say all of them, but most don't necessarily happen in the middle of the field, which is why it's a fairly safe place to happen. Once we get inside the 15s and closer to the five, that's notably where we're gonna have more likelihood to have our box kicks. So once we do, great, where do we wanna be? Obviously not in the chariot position, right? So we have a referee in flat attack, it's actually a pretty good angle to make sure that we're able to see our alignment, we're able to see that last player who might be chasing and make sure that we're in a good position. So it goes back to the same principle as uh, refereeing the ruck, refereeing the scrum. Are we setting ourselves up for success? That's the biggest question. Put yourself in a spot to be able to see what we need to see. Now, granted, how many box kicks do we see? in domestic club rugby, maybe not as many as we'd see in this game because there was a lot in the uh, Super Rugby final, but um, it's just uh, the awareness of where we are on the field, when we might see them, and where we need to position ourselves afterwards, okay? And if we have the help, it's great to have the help um, be there to give us a hand with that offside. Okay, so kicks in open play. Our chasers, are they clearly starting on side? Right, so it's the exact same principle as our box kick. So we'll just watch this example here. Right, okay, so it's just a really clean picture of what we want to see. So how do we manage this as a referee? The first thing we need to do is be able to anticipate it. So what are some of the triggers for us as a, as a referee as we go and try and read the play, of what's coming next to be able to see, okay, the kick is on here. So, I mean, we start inside their half, fairly close to their 22. So what's our indicator here? We have a pretty good one, oh, sorry. We have a pretty good one when it comes to the alignment of the back line. So two things stand out. One is how deep the 10 is, the first receiver. Um, although we tend to play quite deep domestically anyways, um, this is quite deep. This is extremely deep. So that's one indicator. And the other one is how flat the rest of the back line is in terms of uh, their positioning to the first receiver. And then the intent likely at, with that kind of setup is that we're gonna end up with a chase, okay? So our um, role as a referee here, transition through chariot, great, follow that pass, make sure where everyone's on side, and it's a nice easy line to make sure that that space is, um, that space is honored. It's interesting, we talked earlier about what are the three types of kicks, territory, um, in touch, or uh, contest this might not be either one of those so something to keep in mind as we go through are we are we allowing that team now 
who's collected the ball to be able to play within that space. Everything there looked great. That's the kind of picture we want to see. And then the last piece is to really take a look at our contextual judgment of this idea of managing space. So when it comes to game situations, we um, when we look at the amount of decisions we have to make, the majority of them obviously are at tackle ruck time. Okay, the next majority of them are at set piece time. All right, and then a handful are gonna be uh, either foul play or game management things that we need, not tens, dangerous tackles, that kind of stuff, right? Um, whereas the rest of them are te technical decisions around the ruck area, uh, whether that's offside, whether that's not rolling away, et cetera, and then a few technical decisions at um, uh, line out and scrum time. So the rest of what we do as a referee is make these micro decisions all over the field about, okay, well, what is it that is relevant here and do we need to do anything with it? Okay, so let's keep that idea of, of earning space what's material now okay so we're looking at is this space earned legally and what's material okay so we'll take a look at what's relevant right so if everyone watched that clip and said i didn't see anything i'd probably play on that's great, because that's what we're looking for, right? If we were to go back and take a look at every minute detail of this, would we be able to say that there was potentially some scatter rucking here by number four and two by blue? Potentially, right? And this is where I think if we have this, this philosophy around the game, it really helps us identify whether or not incidences become material or not. So when we look at this action here, are they potentially taking away that first defender? Maybe. Are they even maybe holding back this player? Yeah. Is any of it material? No. And here's why. That ball is always going to the first receiver. And although those players might be in a position to mark up, they don't affect the play enough, the, the actions of blue at the ruck previous, for us to need to make a decision here. There's no need to make a decision unless that space is being positively exploited after it was illegally obtained, right? So if we're not, if we're able to see that the Ill illegal use of that space in and around that previous ruck didn't impact the game, then we need to be able to say we're going to play on here. And that goes back to, again, how do we justify each and every one of these little micro decisions in the game? has to do with our philosophy of, okay, have we earned the right to that space? They always had the right to the space out here. They were always gonna get the ball to that space out here. Let's just play within that space then, right? And the more we complicate decisions by looking at minute detail that doesn't impact what's necessarily gonna happen in the game, the more we probably get bogged down in our decision-making as officials. So, just to watch that one one more time all the way through. A little excessive on the ruck, a little tug. But that ball is always going to first receiver, always marked up by the seven. We're always able to play on in that space that we were always going to play into. So let's just move on. It's great. Okay. So that's really it for um, the majority of the presentation. So feel free to type in any and all questions because we will have a bit of time on our hands. Um, but just to go over some of our notes for our coaches and match officials, um, as always, go back to that pre-match plan. When the referee looks at um, uh, this area of the game, are they focused on their process? What is their process for managing space, right? It, are we using our trigger words? So first defender, contest in the air, legal dominance. What are the things that referees are looking to um, incorporate game to game to make sure that they're in that mindset of uh, watching for that contest in space, whatever their definition of that might be, okay? 
Uh, same as, as um, a lot of our modules here, we're looking at how do we balance between our technical need to make decisions or, or the technical aspect of the law, the tactical areas of, of our decision making, and finally our game management. Um, but the most important one when it comes to this issue of space is that contextual piece. Are we getting what's relevant? Are we getting what's clear, right? So if, if things aren't clear, then there's no need, like that box kick example, was a great example that player the chaser is not clearly offside why are we coming back let's make sure we play on with that right so um things to keep in mind as we go through this our position on the field our outcome of the situation um that last example at the ruck was a great example the outcome was always going to be what the outcome was going to be or sorry the out outcome was what it was always going to be so there's no need for us to get involved in any way right uh, and the, the big one for me is, do the players have time and space to make their decisions, right? In that very, very first clip we looked at with the offside line at the ruck, that's where players, um, the majority of players just don't have the time that they've earned to be able to make that decision. So keep that in mind, I think will will help. And then the last one is, um, this is where I think a CMO can really help a referee is when you look at uh, how decisions are being applied, are they consistent? If they're not consistent, that could come down to um, their their use of their definition. Are they clear about it? Is it clear enough for them? Uh, is it clear enough for the players to understand? It's another um, area that they can take a look at. Okay, and um, if they're and and then are they using it and applying it when they look at these areas of the game? So uh, it's always nice to have verbiage, but if we're not gonna use it, if we're not gonna use it as a trigger uh, in our pregame or during the game, then it probably won't be of much value. So it's just a matter of how do we make sure that we're actually putting into practice uh, what it is we're, we're trying to get um, out of our decisions. Okay, so those are the big areas today that we wanted to cover around um, managing space in the offside line. The biggest issue around space is that it um, not 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 having the right to play in that space that you've earned means that we're probably going to have more unforced errors or more forced errors through pressure that's not necessarily legitimate, um, and we're also going to have a slower rugby game in many ways. So uh, the more we can honor that space, I think the better off um, we're gonna it's going to be for us as referees as well as as for the players. Um, last piece, obviously, as always, we do want to touch on our player welfare component. So uh, the World Rugby High Tackle Framework now has been implemented in Canada as of July 1st. Many provincial unions have already held uh, in-person development sessions, and it's really to look at creating consistency in application. I, when we sent it out to provincial unions and referee societies, the goal was to uh, try and get as many of our regular stakeholders in the room as possible right so it's not just referees it's players and coaches and the reason is because oftentimes what we do is um we we add these variations or these laws or whatever they are um in this case it's a law application guideline to look at um trying to improve the game but the problem is we implement them in isolation so referees will take a look at this being like okay now i have to go through this process to identify um, all of the mitigating or aggravating factors that go into my decision. Okay, uh, the problem is if we do that in isolation, coaches and players don't necessarily have uh, the same understanding of the complexities of that and, and how quick does it actually happen. So I encouraged uh, provinces to look at when delivering this and showing the clips that we came up with uh, to get one look at the clip and then make a decision because the reality is on the field the referee will only have one look at the clip and then you can go back and readjust your picture and try and and readjust how it is we we look at making this decision um and the only other point i wanted to make around it is there will be a bit of a feeling out process as we go through the um implementation of the framework not every decision will be 100 percent accurate all the time they never are uh, in most areas of the game, and um, we're certainly going to have some discrepancies, mostly because a lot of times the, the play happens so quickly that referees might not necessarily see 
that first aggravating factor or that first mitigating factor. So what necessarily has to happen then is referees need to just go with what they see and what's clear and the easier and the clearer and the easier it is to see those um, uh, phases of the game or those impacts or those tackles based on how well they're setting themselves up, how well they're ball in line, all that kind of stuff, um, the, the easier it will be to implement the process. The, the more we put ourselves out of position, the tougher it will be. That's just nature of the beast. So um, if anyone has any questions around that, please fire away. Uh, again, it's available at laws.worldrugby.org. And then on the left, as you scroll down, you just uh, click on the law application guideline and it's the first one that pops up. So yeah, I'm not gonna go through um, our kind of zero tolerance for foul play clips because uh, we've we've covered that for the last six and we've moved into a new process. So I just, I want us to make sure that we're focused on from a foul play perspective and a player welfare perspective, we're focused on the application of the framework. Okay, that's all she wrote for tonight, 46 minutes, not too shabby. Um, I'll stay on for a couple of minutes in case people have questions, uh, and then we can uh, wrap it up and go again next month. Okay. Doesn't seem to be anything so far, so I think we will call it a day. Uh, most of you who are on here have my contact details anyway, so feel free to reach out if you need anything. Otherwise, I wish you guys a pleasant evening, and I look forward to seeing you next week. By next week, I obviously meant next month. Okay, thanks. Bye.